returning guest on the show. And uh, honestly, one of my favorites, and it seems to have been one of the best performing episodes. We've got Paul Stobbs back. We talked Nephilim and Clowns last time, and uh, thanks for coming back on, dude. No worries, guys. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's good to be back. I uh, feel like we could get into some more modern things or just kind of, you know, riff about what it's like to be a truther or thoughts on current affairs. But uh, why don't you talk about the book a little bit, too, because I haven't really uh, heard any news on the book. You almost done with it? Uh, yeah, well, the book's, the book's coming along very nicely, actually. I um, I've decided to split it into two and publish two books because I've written 20 chapters and I realize I have a book here of a succinct story that explains the history of the Nephilim and the history of the secret societies and the creation of clowns in the circus and also the inclusion of uh, clown societies throughout culture which uh, venerate their own sacred clowns as they call them which are examples of people using costumes to channel uh, specific spirits and how that also relates to the same practice of using a clown and then I've ended with some uh, DMT trip reports as well <laughs> to show how uh, people have still are still communicating with these beings even the modern day perhaps not in the same way these ancient shamans would have done it which i discussed in the previous chapter but we're still seeing people seeing these entities in the other realm and they certainly do look like clowns so i've stopped there and i've written a book and i've titled it the history so that's part one and part two will be, be about all the other cultures around the world that have ancestor spirit worship going through each continent showing all their costumes and what they wear and how they all have clownish like features and I think I gave a thumbs up there and now the screen's yeah. giving a thumbs up. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's going to be volume two in a year's time. Um, so I am on track. I expect it to be ready by the back end of next year anyway, both volumes. But I've just finished volume one and I'm going to publish that in the next two months. So I'm currently just going through the editing stage, you know, the proofreading stage, all that kind of stuff. Legal stuff, copyright issues, all that, you know, getting the all the legal things sorted. So I, I'm on Kindle publishing. I have it all ready to go and... I've been making the book cover. I'm really excited about it. It looks cool. Um, I've been, my wife's been helping me with that and uh, telling me what does and doesn't look like basic Microsoft Word clip art stuff and what actually looks real and decent. And we've managed to get a decent looking image together now. So I'm excited, yeah. So hopefully that should be uh, published at the end of May, maybe the beginning of mid mid June, something like that. So the book's That's on great. its way. Awesome. Is that the first book you've tried to write? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I, I I have a degree in fine arts. I've I've written a dissertation for ten thousand words on occult symbolism in modern artwork before, <laughs> but uh, and this is more of it. So far, this is more of a hundred thousand word uh, thesis based on uh, biblical and um, British and European history. So this this is something else, and it's um, I try to keep it a schol scholarly work. It's got as much as many references as any any standard it should be you know just to back up the claims i'm making that i aren't i'm not just pulling this out of thin air you know i've got the receipts as well and the, do the historical documentation to prove uh the, the nefarious hidden hand behind the creation of the clown costume in the western world is there it's clear it's clear as day once you put the pieces together um but this is the first book i'm, I'm ever going to publish yeah so it's i've got that pre pre publishing nerves i'm starting to question everything i've ever written <laughs> it's kind of like is <laughs> is this good enough i don't know and i'm trying not to do that thing where you rewrite things to death you just keep rewriting and rewriting and rewriting the same paragraph and all over and over again i think there comes a point where you've got to just leave it as it is and put it out there and just take the feedback for what it is you know so yeah it's exciting stuff Definitely. That's great. And uh, yeah, no, I don't think you could make up the stuff you're talking about, even if you tried. And from following your work, too, it seems like the maybe the rewriting thing, you're literally always uncovering more and more like examples yeah. or uh, connections. And it's kind of like a, a never ending trail that you've gone down versus when you first probably made the connections. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, a good example of that is, you know, I, I have all these chapters already mapped out with all the subheadings of everything I've discussed 
to no end on the channel, you know, but in more detail. And then suddenly this thing happens like two weeks ago where everybody's suddenly seeing demon faces and people, you know, where they have big white smiles and it's called demon face syndrome. And they look like clowns with big wide grins, big bulging eyes, you know, and all this type of thing. And I'm like, of course, this would happen when I'm, I was just about to publish and it's kind of a typical. So I'm going to have to work that into volume two now. <laughs> it's going to get a bit thicker, another 10 pages thicker, no doubt. And it's... um. But that, that's the nature of this theory. It really is just one thing after another. Um, I think someone just sent me a link today about Christian clowns, where they have clown masses in churches in England. <laughs> and I'm like, are you joking? Is this, this is getting out of hand now. <laughs> you know? And uh, I'm excited to see where clown fashion is going to go as well in the next few years, because that's still snowballing away. Um, so, yeah, it's, an, it's a never-ending treasure trove of information but uh you've, you've got to you've got to just get the gist down and paper i think which is what i'm trying to do and then people can make their own connections ad nauseum then for the rest of their life if they can but uh I, it's one thing to have videos on youtube but it's another to have it immortalized in ink on paper which is what i'm trying to get this this done and then as you were explaining maybe then i can move on with my life and maybe start talking about <laughs> other topics once more because uh i have inadvertently become the a quasi expert on clown history and i never intended to be the guy talking about clowns <laughs> you know, it just kind of ended up that way um but yeah absolutely it's again it's it's never ending definitely funny where life takes us uh mm. with that demon face syndrome thing immediately your work and our conversation that we had in the last episode about like the sightings of the nephilim we even have that in the intro now of our mm -hmm. show you're talking about the nephilim sightings and uh immediately other thing that comes to mind is my all-time favorite movie they live like i love that movie and i'm like this Great is obviously movie. just a cover story for anyone who starts to you know <laughs> see this stuff manifesting and mm -hmm. i'm sure you've seen a lot of stuff about the the coming eclipse people who spit in all types of wild theories about all oh, the eclipse it's gonna uh cause a portal to open and there's gonna be demons running around or there's gonna be the the three days of darkness there's gonna be oh, uh yeah stuff to do with the lost tribes literally any type of conspiracy you could think of is connected with the supposed eclipse and uh i think speaking for all of us or anyone who's you know been into conspiracies for a while there's always some big next event that you know this is going to happen <laughs> there's going to be this like and i fall for it sometimes too i'm like oh hmm. there is a lot of you know symbolism and numerology around it maybe maybe something crazy is going to happen so it's almost like they try to exhaust us with <laughs> the possibilities Absolutely, yeah. Well, I've been talking a lot about that recently, obviously, with um, this whole millennial reign theory, which is popping off right now and getting really big in the culture of conspiracy. And uh, it does feel like a lot of these events they're forcing on us through the media, like the, the coming apocalyptic, cross-shaped, over-America eclipse going through all the cities of Nineveh type although everything's involved while Devil's Comet's going to be visible in the thing you know and they're, they're going to sacrifice those red heifers while they're at it you know over there it's all just one thing after the hype 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 uh, tribulations just around the corner Jesus is just about to return prepare to suffer and be beheaded all these type of things you know make sure you preps get make sure you get your prep bag you know only uh, 59.99 if you use my promo code all that type of stuff is happening <laughs> online right now and it's kind of ill from my perspective with the stuff I've been looking into that maybe that already happened in the past mate and we're we're just living through a deception where they're trying to make it look like that's happening it just seems so contrived and silly to me now in in hindsight but uh one interesting thing about the black hole sun thing relating to the clown topic um is just that the song black hole sun um was it was it who sung that song again? I, I got this wrong. Yeah, Soundgarden. Soundgarden. Or Soundgarden. Soundgarden. Yeah, okay, yeah, Sound. I got it wrong in the last stream, and people were like, you're crazy, how can you not know who Soundgarden are? It's like, I did know it, I just slip of the tongue. But um, if you remember that music video, it shows a lot of people during an eclipse suddenly developing big, wide, oh, yeah. smiling grins and big, big eyes using you know, that, crazy. That, that, tip, that typical early... Uh, graphic effects you know that they were experimenting a lot with back then and during that time but uh you realize it was that a hint that when this eclipse happens will it make people start seeing through the veil just a little bit more and perhaps seeing one of two things you could interpret it as these demon faces people are seeing is people are witnessing their true nature and they're not really human at all. That's a they live type situation. Uh -huh. Or are people just seeing through the veil and can now see the demons in people, the demons that are inhabiting people, the demons that are using people to experience stuff through their senses. And we can just kind of 
see how they've parasitically molded themselves to their the host's senses, the eyes, the mouth and everything. And now you're seeing that person with devilish features because the demon within them is latched onto them quite thoroughly. Are we just seeing that instead? Who knows? But it's interesting through predictive programming that you know, the, the guy who sung about this thing, I think he died of suicide mysteriously. Was that what happened? I think he was suicided, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And it's just odd that they were singing about this song in a true predictive programming fashion that coinciding with an eclipse would be a big wide face demon phenomena thing going on. And we actually have just seen that happen. An eclipse is about to happen and now people are seeing demon faces with a new syndrome that's just been invented to explain yeah, it right. all away and gaslight people. It's like, oh, you're seeing demons in people's faces, are you? Well, there's a syndrome for that. It's kind of, <laughs> you're just crazy. You know, the, we have an excuse. We have an answer for why you're seeing that. You know, it's just the timing is just impeccable, isn't it? It's just silly. Yeah, That is freaking nuts. And, uh, scary let's say, let's say that the predictive programming is real for that and then uh when it comes to like the 9 11 predictive programming that they were blasting for decades and mm -hmm. but i'm sure there's like in hindsight we'll be able to look back and see like in all these cartoons or whatever there was an eclipse and then something crazy happened or <laughs> a movie and some other music video or something and uh i remember you just said a few minutes ago that you originally did a paper on occult uh symbolism in like the arts or in the music industry and stuff is that available anywhere oh no it, it, it was that? it was a university dissertation for the oh, university of for the university of lincoln so it's possibly in their libraries somewhere i don't know but it was more about modern art it was a bit more fancy and pretentious and all out there and uh, the modern art scene is just weird it's like the fashion industry it's just weird you wouldn't really know anything about it unless you were in it type of scene you know but uh even then i, I would look back on what i wrote and think god you knew nothing then compared to what you know now it's one of those you know but uh it was it was during my when i was waking up phase when i wrote that you know when you're first just discovering this stuff and it's like i'm seeing these things everywhere there's eyes all over the place there's hidden geometries behind every great painting that's kind of alluding to a hidden hand and all these kind of uh, secret societies it's like da vinci code stuff you know what i mean um and, I'm, and that's what my dissertation was about as well as um i used to listen to a, a a podcast called was it red ice radio or something like that i think they were swedish there was a swedish couple who used to make loads of videos back in the day in like 2010 2011 about symbolism you know and they showed all the the sun disc symbolism the arch symbolism in logos and just any any occult symbol you could imagine they showed all the logos that would display oh, yeah. the same thing the winged disc and all this sort of stuff and i was like I, that blew my mind back then my tiny un unknowledgeable mind you know who didn't know anything i was like it's everywhere it's in everything so when i was at university at the time doing an art degree i was like i have to write about this so that's most of it's just about that just the obvious symbols that are in everything in terms of artwork um so yeah I, I, I think i have it on my shelf dusty somewhere it's like 10 years old if i if i do find it maybe i'll, I'll take a photo of it of, of each page and i'll send it to you or something nice. <laughs> just like you know but i'd be i bet it's full of spelling errors as well and i, I was very high throughout my entire university degree so <laughs> i do not imagine much of it is, is coherent when i think about it in hindsight but um this book that i've written now sober for eight years nothing like that is it's a much more coherent and better i'll, I'll just promote that as well <laughs> I yeah. can definitely relate. I feel like uh, the symbols and stuff like that is it's like wearing the they live glasses in real life because you're like, oh, my God, it's everywhere. Look, this, that, like you're just breaking it down constantly. You can't mm -hmm. even like look at the world normally again. You're just looking at it through those glasses, mm -hmm. like the uh, corporate logos, like you said, or the paintings, whatever else, like it all it all is ending up being some like Saturn worship or some something like that. Yeah, occult like Mason symbol, just stuff mm -hmm. like that. And uh, as far as just being a stoner when you're first waking up, that's how a lot of people start, I think, too. Something <laughs> about, I mean, I don't really smoke anymore, but definitely when I would be smoking a lot of weed, I'd be like download, instant download sometimes when you're like going down these trails, like, oh, this, what if this is connected to this and that? And yeah. I, uh, I know that uh, we talked too before about the DMT or psychedelics and whatever, that it definitely kind of opens you up to the spirit realm and, Obviously, that would open you up to the dark and bad aspects of the spirit realm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was your channel or if it was maybe uh, Mind Unveiled. Somebody was breaking down that the the Templars, like who were going to Jerusalem, like however many thousand years ago, to try and uh, find these holy relics and stuff that they picked up using weed from uh, 
another secret society called the called the Hashishans, which was like the original order of the assassins. It was like a uh, Arabic like mystery school where they would take a lot of uh, mm-hmm. like hash and stuff and drug their members and then go commit a bunch of murders. And it's funny that that's one of the first, uh, you know, like weed heavy using cults instead of just like the stoner stereotype of just. I don't know, chilling, eating food, listening to music. <laughs> no, these dudes were like doing rituals and going and murdering people. Yeah, the, the Templars are an interesting one because obviously they were set out as something like maybe like a, a Catholic crusader type cult of some kind. But uh, they ended up coming back with Sufi occult Gnostic wisdom oh, instead, you know, which they picked up along their journey. So it became something else completely. I agree with you on that. Um, I actually talked with um I talked with somebody about this myself. I can't remember who it was, um, but I, I do. I think I saw what Mind Unveiled was showing as well myself. Something, and it's it's Gnosticism is an all pervasive parasite. I'll say that much. It gets into every belief system, and 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 it's um, it's a very enticing. I can see why people get into it. That's initially where I was at the beginning of all of this. You know, when I was writing my thesis and all these symbols, I was seeing it from a, a hermetical, alchemical um, perspective. You know what I mean? Trying to understand the uh, the uh, the archetypical symbolism behind certain collective consciousness symbols, and all the I was all in that realm. You know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's trippy stuff. I mean, I, I wouldn't recommend doing any of that now, like psychedelics anymore. It's a, it's a world I left behind, and it's kind of a big part of my channel. I'm kind of trying to explain to people how, look, it's not necessarily that the, the spirit world or the astral realm is a bad place. It's a perfectly necessary place, in fact. It's a part of creation. It's like um, the plumbing behind the walls or something, or the wiring of the universe. It's kind of like it has to be there. For this to be here, it's it's just they are the same place technically. It's just opposite. We don't we don't see through walls in our perception in our reality. And there's no need to. You don't need to know how how the thing works in order to use the thing. You know that's kind of what I consider the spirit realm versus our realm to be. That's the kind of dichotomy it is. It's the warp of the woof of a rug. You know, you get this beautiful arabesque rug. You know, which is just full of beautiful paisley designs and swirls and and flower and floral motifs. But you turn that rug over and it's an absolute mess of just strings attached to the other places where you see the artist is like skipped over places to get some color in another spot. And it's, um, but that's necessary to have the thing on top, which is what you're supposed to see, what you're supposed to enjoy. And I believe that's our reality. A lot of these uh, psychedelic thinkers and explorers have it the other way around. They think where they're going is better than this realm. They think they're going to a, a more heightened place. They tend to believe they're going to like a, the fifth dimension where the ascended masters are or the, I don't know, na- name what you want to call them. Everyone has their own view on what they're going to talk to there. It's, it's either us from the future, the ascended masters, the great teachers, aliens, angels. I don't know. They, they come as many beings and many, many things, but... Uh, one common thread is they seem to look something akin to a jester or a clown as well. So um, from my history research, it seems like, okay, these are not collective archetypes of the Jungian unconscious reflecting aspects of humanity back at ourselves in order to help us grow and learn or something, some nonsense like that. These are actually real entities with separate consciousnesses from us who were there for a specific reason. And there's a history to back up how they ended up there. And they are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. So we shouldn't really be in that realm, that perfectly safe and normal realm in and, in and of itself that should exist and is a creation of God's creation, the perfectly natural place to exist. But it's full of enemies. It's full of demons. It's full of the things we shouldn't be dealing with. And maybe there's a reason why we don't perceive that realm all the time anymore. I believe we used to. It seems like people were very well in tune with this realm, just naturally without the need for drugs at some point. But I think after the flood, that rainbow seal was given to us as a covenant from God to say, you know, not only will I not flood the earth again for your sake, but also now you can perceive the spectrum of light. Your bandwidth has been limited, so you don't have to deal with these spirits anymore that just have just been wiped out by the flood in a physical sense. You no longer have to communicate with them. They can't influence you. They can't get in the way. They're trapped now, and you can live life more abundantly in this current state that, that you've been put in as like a mercy more than anything because there's billions of these entities on the other side that are just waiting to possess you, abuse you, use you, and just get in your mind, mess with you, send you insane and crazy because they, they hate you by the nature of them not being you. And that's kind of... It's a no-man's land. It's a war zone. Stay in the trench. Do not go wandering around in no-man's land. <laughs> like there's, there's no, there's, You'll get no enlightenment there that you think you're getting. You'll bring you nothing but death, pain, and misery. But you will be believed for a short 
while you are getting something brilliant. You believe you're growing in spiritualism and, and you're, you're becoming an enlightened being, but all you're doing is getting an inflated ego and a God complex and um, not really growing in any tangible physical sense. Usually these people who think I know all the secrets of the world and I'm brilliant because of all my psychedelic experiences, more often than not, they are lonely, isolated people with no children or family who are possibly just smoking weed constantly and <laughs> watching videos online and actually have no real tangible progression in their life. They own no property They because they, they don't need property because it's all just uh, ethereal t- tangent nonsense, you know, that isn't, isn't real anyway. And why have any earthly attachments? It's kind of you realize their life is hell, but they believe themselves sure. to be wise. And that's kind of... Jesus Christ showed the way to live life and have life more abundantly, and it doesn't involve having to communicate with spirit entities in an astral realm. It's um, He showed the way, and his way has shown me real tangible results. So that's kind of what my message is as an ex-psychedelic tripper myself. You know, I, I'm not saying this as somebody who doesn't know what he's talking about. I was microdosing LSD every day for like three years. I smoked cannabis for like nine years every single day, five times a day. Being sober was a trip for me for eight years of my life. You know, I, I've, I've done DMT at least four times, salvia about six times. I've, take, I've, I've done it all. You know, I've done psilocybin mushrooms three times. And like I said, I was microdosing tabs of LSD every other day in different doses and lengths and making journals about it. I was there with the rest of them. But I realized my life is falling apart and... There's no wisdom here. Certainly no wisdom in the creation itself anyway. You need to go looking for the creator. That's kind of what I realized. Yeah, I, I like a lot of that. I like and I resonate with a lot of what you said. And it's funny when you realize it all comes back to the fallen angel, uh, like religions or belief systems too. We had a guy, Brandon Kroll on the show. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but oh no, he, no, no. he's got some good work and a lot of it kind of overlaps with yours and you two would be a great conversation if you two ever linked up or maybe we get you both on here, but yeah, he was the first one to bring up that uh, you mentioned the hermetic principles. And it had me thinking of that, that Hermes, like the character and uh, me and Mike were going back on this a little bit recently. Cause uh, everyone was, you know, on Captain's dick for going on Joe Rogan and talking about stuff. And I listened to the episode. It wasn't even like, he didn't even talk about anything really like revealing or very rudimentary. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And everyone's like, oh, my God, dude, Cat Williams dropping the truth bombs. He's oh. talking about the Emerald Tablets of Thoth and Hermes <laughs> Trismegistus. And me and Mike, when Mike had his old podcast like years ago, we were talking about the uh, Emerald Tablets. But that uh, brings me back to that Brandon guy we had on. He was saying that uh, Hermes is just literally the ultimate homage to a fallen angel because Mount Hermon is where the the fallen angels came down to meet with man and like you know, mated with the women and kind of started the whole Nephilim thing. And mm-hmm. their teaching was just like, oh, yeah, uh, you are a god. You can become a god if you just learn enough things. And mm-hmm. then you get the guy who's uh, smoking weed all day or whatever, like <laughs> you said, who really has nothing going for him, but thinks he's, uh, you know, God himself because of all the knowledge he's obtained. And it's like the memes. Anytime it's a meme about like, you know, people digging into the occult or whatever, new agey type of stuff, it's always like a, that, like scribbled out face guy, like sunken eyes, just like super tired and exhausted. Like, <laughs> yeah, don't worry. I figured out all the secrets. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank God they know it all. What would we do without them? You know? Um, yeah. A lot of it's rooted in pride. Absolutely. It's the, uh, you will be as God's promise from the garden of Eden. It's the original lie really, you know, just partake of the knowledge of good and evil and you'll be like gods and your eyes will be opened. And it's kind of, a lot of people get upset because it's kind of like, well, what about free will, you know? And I, I actually think we're terrible with free will. I think whole of the whole of existence is God teaching us that given free will, we'll make a mess of it. <laughs> it's what I think he's letting us do. He's let us have it and let us see that it's not always cracked up to be in a way. And a lot of people, you know, want to want to carve their own way, their own path and become wizards or something so they can have ultimate control over existence and influence over people or something like that. And um, what what I realize is it's the prodigal son analogy. It's kind of you can go out there and do it. Then go and make go and do your own thing. Find your own way, and you'll realize it leads to nothing but death and destruction and misery and pain and loneliness. That's where you'll end up. And then come back to the father. He'll welcome with welcome you in with loving arms. He'll give you your inheritance he had waiting for you, and he'll actually give you the life or a path or a direction you always wanted. You'll actually get to live the life you wanted to live. <laughs> like it was there all along. And it's kind of, that's the irony of the, 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 the trickery of these jesters in the other realm who are lying to people. They're stealing, they're robbing you of your birthright. They're trying to 
steal something and sell back to you something you already had. Do you get what I mean? It's like stealing your own pocket watch and selling it back to you. That's what they've basically done, basically. They, they, you already had it all. And it's just like uh, the lie in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. Oh, eat this apple and you get this knowledge and your eyes will be open and you'll be as gods. Not already realising they're already as close to being as god as you possibly can be. They are walking with God in the Garden of Eden. How much better can it get? <laughs> you know, but the lie was that you can always get better. The grass is always greener and that's really what a lot of this psychedelic stuff is all about. And on the Hermes thing as well, it's, it's not just an homage to Mount Hermon, but Hermes, the messenger of the gods, is another one who's a Prometheus analogy as well, which is something similar of the one who stole fire from the gods and gave it to man, you know, which is a Lucifer light yeah. bringer, knowledge bringer analogy as well, which is just an anagram for the Satan's actually the good guy. That's basically what Lucifer is trying to be. That's the name. It means the light bringer, you know. It's all just the same stories told over and over again, and it's all rooted in pride. That's what I found, and a lot, and that's the issue with pride. Prideful people don't want to admit they've been tricked, or that they are even prideful. They want to believe they're egoless, uh, identity identityless, uh, and uh, ascended beyond all that kind of stuff. People, you know, and as a Christian, I would even I would realize even in my state as as a as a born again believer, I still fall massively short and um, I'm trying every day to be better, you know, and uh, I still keep failing. And that's, that's Christ offers that good news. You can be forgiven. Humans make mistakes. Just, just keep going. <laughs> you know. But these, these people who take these psychedelics for too long, they end up in a place where they really do think they are like God or, oh, I'm, I'm just an aspect of God who's forgotten that he's God so he can experience what it's like to be a human or something, some convoluted nonsense like that, you know? And um, I, I kind of, I get a little bit exacerbated with it all because I get a lot of people going on my channel who I think they hear me talk about the clown stuff and they see my logo and they think I'm one of them. They think, oh, this guy must be another, you know, alchemical thinker, Gnostic type who's there to talk about Christ consciousness or something like that and give me some esoteric wisdoms. And it's kind of like, no, I've got some esoteric wisdom to teach you, but I'm leading you back to Christ at the end of the day. And no, you're not a god. And when as soon as they hear me say that, it's like, oh, God, another religious freak. Bye. <laughs> and it's like, and it's... I guess I'm a trap for them in a way. <laughs> they didn't. They didn't expect Jesus to be preached to them at any moment, but uh, you know, surprise. That's where it ends up. Uh, what's the Mark Twain? It's easier to uh, convince someone that they, or it's easier to fool someone than it is to convince them that they've been fooled. That's Absolutely. a quote by Mark Twain. Yeah. That's oh yeah. That reminds me of. Absolutely. What, Go what do you? Um, I don't want to say prediction. Cause I like that. I feel like that comes with the implication that if you're wrong, you know, it's, I don't know, but what are your, what are your best thoughts of kind of, what do you feel is, or we're on the verge of, or what do you think is going to happen maybe in the next six to 12 months? Like Ooh. your best guesses. Oh dear. Um, look, I'm not a date setter. And that, you know, I've never been a date setter. Cause I hate, I hate that. I honestly hate telling people, Oh, you better prepare. Cause this is just about to happen is around the corner. Um, let's just say, let's just say the 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 future, not too distant future. Yeah, no, I mean, I can I can only predict. I can only make a best guess analogy, and this is not you know the the script as I know it. But I have plenty of ideas of what could unfold in the next few years, and it's all highly dependent on where we are in the timeline of events. If you want to go off the revelation stuff as well, um, what I've kind of been speculating about is this 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 long term agenda we've seen at play for a long time about the uh, the alien invasion, and I've been trying to figure out where does this thing fit into the overall narrative because it's the programming's been there for decades, over a hundred years now, you know since. Um, that, that radio broadcast, you know, which says the War of the Worlds and all these type of things, you know, wherever people were shooting at grain towers thinking the tripods had come to invade, you know, because they thought it was a genuine news um, broadcast. And that was the first sign, I think, given to the controllers that people can be manipulated with this, this narrative of aliens coming to invade us. And they'll actually do stuff if we convincingly show them through media that we're under attack by aliens. So let's uh, let's roll with it. And I think they've, they've mastered that programming for a long time. And I think people are pretty well prepped for an alien invasion now. I, I do think 
most secular minded people who don't have any concept of anything spiritual or conspiratorial and are just living in the world completely oblivious i think they're bored and they just want the aliens to turn up i think they've been primed enough to just expect it to happen at any moment and they'll be cool with it when it does happy in fact finally something interesting's happening you know i think that's what people will be at like apathy has got them in the end to agree with that agenda but then but thinking about the millennial kingdom theory and um i realized that this they could play out actually in ways that we we didn't anticipate and it's about that the uh the, the giant mothership independence day style when it rocks up or suddenly becomes visible let's say floating over the north pole or something you know like it's just this enormous sixteen thousand kilometer wide thing is just floating there and, and suddenly the cameras get pointed to it all the news shows on the screen this thing's just turned up we don't know what to do you know it's, it's just it's just an enormous mothership and i imagine if if the little season theory is correct and the millennial reign has already happened and we're in satan's little season well, that means Jesus never actually left and neither did the beloved city or New Jerusalem, which is a giant floating cube, as it's been described by um, the book itself, the Bible, you know. New Jerusalem is, is basically either a giant pyramid or a giant cube of some kind, and it'll be seen by everybody once it becomes visible. And we've kind of been programmed to believe that when something like that appears, an enormous floating city or spaceship, it's aliens from space come to attack us, right? And I do feel like we're on the verge of them just doing that one day. Maybe in the next five years, just aliens have turned up. And we've all been prepped with Project Bluebeam for a while to believe that they had the capacity to project a fake alien invasion, right? Or something like that. And all the Christians have been primed to believe, oh, that's the Antichrist. They're going to try and trick us with a fake Jesus or something like that using holograms, you know. And they're going to try and trick all the Christians into believing the second coming's come. But really, that's the Antichrist. Look out for that guy, you know. So they've already got the Christians primed to fight back against it when it does turn up, the big mothership. And they've got all the secular world people ready with all the horror movies of alien invasions, ready to all unite as one to fight against the evil invading forces. All humanity comes together as one. Well, there's your New World Order. There's your Gog and Magog war described in the Bible where everybody gathers from all four corners of the earth to make war with the camp of saints as it's described now how do you convince the entire earth to all drop their differences and come together as one to go fight a common enemy it has to be something huge and i do feel like the alien invasion is the way they're going to do that but here's the double blind that's jesus we've all been just convinced to go and attack new jerusalem the beloved city zion you know the, the floating beloved city in the camp of saints and what comes after that is complete destruction and fire down from heaven you know so in ex in the most extreme case that could happen <laughs> because as soon as you see aliens happen I, 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 didn't we just see an alien sighting at a shopping mall not that long ago yeah. police cars everywhere this then we would you find uh, the the little alien found in mexico or something like that was remember that guy it looks like a paper mache little model or something like that i feel like the they've always been dropping hints if not through mainstream media and movies and books and tv series and all that sort of thing then in the news every now and then they'll just drop this little thing here and there or a mysterious event happens here you know in preparation for the coming event and i was trying to imagine well how would that play out then because if it's jesus he's not going to attack anybody so how can you justify attacking it do you get what i mean where does that come from and i realized well actually project blue beam um they're directed energy weapons the flying saucer hidden technologies they probably have you know that the, um, that they're just waiting to use which we know the nazis were building like in the 40s sure. so they for what they have now is probably way beyond our perceptions of just winged planes with jets on them that they, they probably literally have flying discs ready to go you know well as soon as the new jerusalem appears or they decide to turn the camera on the thing which has always been there and we've just been kept in the dark about it as soon as they do that they could themselves make it look like New Jerusalem is attacking us by making flying saucers just appear everywhere and stop destroying people and attacking cities. And who knows, maybe the Nephilim spirits, they'll find a way to get them back into the realm physically again. And they'll start, demons will just start turning up and ripping people apart. Maybe. Like all the alien films we see, like the Tomorrow War film that just came out, where it's literally giant white tentacled, uh, scorpion tailed, big teeth demons just running around killing people. You know, maybe... Or they'll all just, the, the enemy will literally just pull out everything they can 
to convince us that that giant mothership is responsible for all the destruction that's just occurred. Why would you think any differently? But all it really is, is they've staged a fake alien invasion in light of New Jerusalem now being visible. So we'll be convinced it all must have come from the mothership. Then humanity retaliates, drops their differences, all comes together. Everyone like the sand of the sea, billions of people all come together in one war and go and go for it. And I know it sounds extreme, but the programming is heavy for this. It's everywhere. It's in everything. This is Avengers Endgame I'm talking about here. You know, this is this is it. This is the final war. This is the big thing. And it's not it's not petty little squabbles over territory like in Russia or Ukraine that we should be keeping our eyes on. It's not all about Palestinians and Israel or the building of temples and all this type of stuff. These are all just orchestrated, convoluted script Hollywood scripts to make people believe they're living in tribulation or something like that. Because I think if they can get us convinced of that, then they have the Christians waiting for the Antichrist to appear first. If the Christians are still waiting for an Antichrist to appear, they won't believe it's Jesus when he does turn up. It does seem like something like that's happening. We do know, we do know this. Um, I think it was Helena Bavatsky started the Theosophical Society in the early 1900s. Uh, she had Alice Bailey was one of her students who I think in, um, I think it may have been the, the 30s, I think it was the 40s, wrote a book called The Externalization of the Hierarchy. And in 2025, she says the world teacher will appear. And this was, you know, like 100 years ago, she said this. And she said, we're going we're gonna to use wars and destruction and, and, com and control of the media and the narrative controls to get people ready for to make the world such a terrible place that they'll need a world teacher to appear who will then teach humanity to the next stage of consciousness and enlightenment. Um, so whether that was a red herring again now, I don't know if there actually is going to be a character that appears who claims to be Jesus and has come to help us teach us things, but it isn't. I don't know, but there's that as well. 2025, last I checked, is in next year. So what are they planning to do with that? You know, Because the Theosophical Society is, is, is the loosest trust. It's still around today. It's heavily involved in politics and control and influence, you know, and this, they had a newspaper called Lucifer when it was around back in the day and it became the loosest trust today. And these are big think tanks that are involved in culture creation, you know. So what are they planning? What are they going to reveal? I, I have no idea. Then you've got a couple in 15 minute cities as well and the pods and the bugs and the this, the, the dissolution of farmland. They've corralling everybody into cities, you know, and, and it's... Something's going on, isn't it? And I, I, I would hazard a guess of what agenda they're going to suddenly just play, what card they're going to play. But they have like an A to Z of like agendas they could just rock up at any moment that will work for the moment that the whatever's happening at the time, you know. And I, I do feel like Satan's on the clock a little bit. Like he, his time is short. His little season is a little season if that's where we are. So when his time runs out and bam, New Jerusalem appears, it's like oh. It's over. This is it now. This is the final thing. Our time's up. He'll just play whatever play, whatever th script works at the time, wherever he's got the people at, you know. So, who knows? But I'm 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 one of those guys who kind of I, I'm not I'm not going to get caught off guard here. I want to know every possibility, and I'm going to speculate every possibility to its natural conclusion to try and create some kind of holistic image in my mind. So, whenever whatever does go down goes down, I'll have an idea, a rough idea. Enough to probably not get tricked is what I'm aiming for, but we live in the world of deception, guys. I mean, I might, I might get tricked. Hopefully not. <laughs> we'll see. What do you think? What do you think is gonna? What do you see the world in the next five years? What's your, what's your, uh, what's your plan? What's your vision? Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know, man. Um, I don't really see much of a future. Um. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I don't mean that in a negative way. I just, uh, I don't know. Like, it, I was just talking to my wife the other day, and it's like, I'm 43, and I genuinely have never been this concerned or unsure about the future. You know, I mm. remember being, I remember being like, uh, like 12, like 11, 12 years old, and uh, we had the, um, the Iraqi war, the Persian Gulf war. And I remember it was like, you know, it was the first war that was on CNN, regular TV all the time here. 
And I remember just being so frightened as a kid, like, oh, shit, this could all end at any minute. And then I hadn't had that feeling for a long time. And then it recently came back again with all this shit with the Ukraine and Israel and Russia. It's just like, dude, I don't know. I honestly don't have much hope, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, I get it. I do. It's just scary. I, I, I try not to pay attention to the narratives on the news and the mainstream media because it is all fear, doom and gloom. But at the same time, I also know that a lot of this is just one giant play, man. It's just a stage, and these are all actors involved in all of this. And uh, the the conflicts we see, it's it's play fighting, literally in, in the literal sense. And um, WWE. Yeah, I'm not sure what they're actually up to with all of this. If it's all about um, the changing borders or something, or establishing bases in specific places for a future event, but it's all smoke and mirrors. There's some there's something else behind all of this. Um, the building towards something i can say that for sure and i get i get that feeling you're talking about where it things felt like they would last forever when i was a kid and right now i'm not i'm still young and i'm like okay this doesn't i don't see how much i can't see how this can go on for much longer i do have that feeling you know and this doesn't again i know it was scary during the iraqi wars and and the second one as well and Obviously, what will happen with 9-11 from there and the controls that were put on us and all that type of thing. But uh, this it does feel different now. I feel like everybody's exhausted. I think we've all got to a bit of a point where we're kind of like, God, just ended already. <laughs> what, is, what is going on here? Because, I, I mean, I'm, I'm never going to own a house, I'm probably, and it's, it's kind of... I don't want to think about the future my child's going to have. I really don't. Because it... It's getting weird. It's getting weird out there, oh, man. you know, and I'm going to homeschool my kid in the hopes to try and do the best I can to keep them free from the indoctrination that's to play in the schools. Never mind. That's that's another thing. But it, it's 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 odd. And but at the same time, has every generation felt like this since the beginning of time? Are we just so exaggerating and think we're special as well? I'm aware of that, too. But because we're the conspiracy thinkers and we know about all these agendas at play, it has a heightened level of like, <laughs> oh no, on top of everything else, isn't it? That it, The normies are feeling one thing, we're, we're seeing like nine dimensions above it and we're like, we're still feeling just as bad as they are. We're like, oh no, this is, it's, it's still bad. No matter which level of knowledge you have, this it's all bad news either way, isn't it? And it's, I don't know, I, I, I'm thinking maybe that's why, because it is just so crazy right now and it seems to be crescendoing. It is going to be a right play the alien card. Go, let's let's mix it up. Let's just change everything. Let's just change everything that we've established prior. Um, who knows? Who knows? But I, I think I think we're ready for something big. And like so maybe this eclipse is going to be one of those like uh, the veil is just going to get so thin because of the energy of the eclipse. Whatever an eclipse truly is, because I don't think it's really the moon going in front of the sun at this point. I don't know what's going on with that. But maybe it will like reveal kind of like a. A reality we weren't aware of quite literally with our own eyes like maybe people will suddenly see the nephilim everywhere for like a second and then they <laughs> come back and it's kind of like, what happened here who knows um but the hype around this event coming up is is weird because i've seen hype before i've seen hype around events before but this one's got a an odd flavor to it because uh, i've normally in the past just been able to go that's ridiculous move on like, do you remember the uh, the zombie apocalypse of October that everyone thought was going to happen with the... Uh, the, the alarm thing? The, the alarm, do you remember that? Yeah. 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 Um, I, I got a strike for talking about that just before the event. Cause, That's and I, crazy. And I had to do a, a survey to remove the strike after three months. They would remove it if I did the survey. And it was basically conforming to the mainstream narrative that, you know, um, certain frequencies are perfectly safe um certain things people have put into their bodies over the past few years will not interact with with frequencies and <laughs> you know, that's, like, i had to i had to do a, a i agree with the, the 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 current thing tick box thing you know just to like it's like a it's like a verbal slap mental slap on the wrist you know what i mean For like sure. no you should you crazy conspiracy theorists don't say these obviously true things and it's kind of but i made a video saying this is a ridiculous move on People aren't going to turn into zombies. And I still got a strike. <laughs> and the thing is, that day did come and pass. A lot of fear was hyped up about it. And it was just a huge nothing burger in the end. And I, I, I would safely probably say this is going to be the same thing. This is going to be the same thing. But there's definitely an impact to, to, to generating that much fear. So they could easily, if, if enough people are hyped up enough, they can make something happen.
So I think it's kind of a, it's a play. It's a back and forth here. It's kind of, we give them power by paying attention to their stories. So hopefully this, this day passes and it was just nothing. And, every, and it's just another one of those events that makes Christians look stupid. You know, hopefully that's what it, that's all this is really about at the end day. It's just another boy who cried wolf situation to make people fall, lose their faith even more. I hope that's, I hope that's the level of agenda that's at play with this event. It's just one of those mind control things to make people lose faith. I hope demons don't just rock up all of a sudden. I, I really, you know, <laughs> fingers crossed, but uh, there's something about this. I feel, I feel like they're really throwing a lot of stuff together at this one. They're trying to make a lot of stuff stick with it, you know, with the, the, the cow sacrifices, the comet as well, the city names and the shape of it as it crosses over, the earthquake that just happened as well. They're trying to like say, oh, this must be tribulation, right? And they, even then I'm like, nah, this is, this is odd. This is odd. Like I'm sure eclipses happen all the time, everywhere, like quite a lot all over the world. Why, why does this one particular one in America make all the difference all of a sudden? Like it's a very Americentric theory as well. And it's, I, I don't know, I can't really, I don't know, what, what do you think? Are you, how do you feel about this event? What have you heard? Have you had any juicy extra little tidbits surrounding this event, this this apocalyptic eclipse? <laughs> have you heard anything I, at all? Uh, I know that they're going to do something at CERN the same day too. And like you said, the red heifer, the yeah. comet, all this stuff. CERN's going to do another uh, particle collision and try and, you know, open up a black hole or whatever. Of course. I see a lot of people going on about, oh, uh, the eclipse shapes out a, a Hebrew letter. This is clearly a sign from God to like, I don't know. No one ever has a conclusion for it or, or no. like a, a direct answer. It's always just kind of like fear speculation. And yeah, I fully anticipate it to just be another day that comes and goes. Uh, it's, I definitely get caught up with watching stuff on it. Cause it's interesting. And like you said, it's kind of like, we almost get bored and want something crazy to happen. <laughs> like, Oh, what if we really did start seeing the Nephilim for a day? Like, yeah, it wouldn't be good, but it would break up the monotony. <laughs> and as we were talking about, uh, you know, just kind of like feeling hopeless or something like that, all of us here, long time conspiracy theorists. So let's, let's even think back to, I don't know, like 2008 to 2012 ish type of time when everyone was worried about all oh, the 2012, uh, the Mayan calendar, the that's going to be the end. It's going to be this, that, like all the conspiracies that we thought of back then, like that we would be like afraid of, like, oh no, they're going to, they're going to do FEMA camps. They're going to, they're <laughs> going to get rid of currency. They're going to make uh, everybody take chips. They're going to, you know, it was like things that sounded ridiculous back then seem like, oh, completely plausible now. And like the, if you could go back to like uh, Paul or Mike or anyone listening out there, yeah, like I said, like 2009 ish type of time and show them what we're in right now, they would have their minds blown and be like, dude, I could have never seen that. Like that is ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, I remember, I remember the Mayan calendar hype. That's that's what got me into all of this. That was the first major uh, crazy theory I'd heard as a normie that made me think, oh, what, what have they seen? What's making them say this? You know, what's going on here? The world, the Mayan calendar's coming to an end and the world's going to end? This is nuts. Like, so I went into it and then you start rabbit hole connecting then, don't you? And going down all different kind of warrens and ended up at the end of all these crazy theories. And that's here I am, you know, 10 years later with my own channel talking about these things since that event. But uh, I remember I remember the hype around that. And I remember people believing the poles are going to shift. Um, and obviously Nibiru was going to make its cycle back into our solar system and come close to Earth as well at the same time. Um, and people say biblically that was Wormwood and, and it's kind of the Anunnaki are going to return on that day too and we're going to become a slave class once again to mine gold for them. All this because they need gold for their atmosphere and it was all very planetary based, you know, um, mainstream science worldview, cosmological worldview based, you know, Zachariah Sitchin stuff it seems to be based mainly on. Um, but I, I, rem I remember the tangible fear that was surrounding all of that. I remember th they decided the mainstream media, what did they do? They brought out a film called 2012, which was literally just a, a, t a, what a, t it's obviously a two hour epic of the world being utterly decimated by every possible worst case scenario you could imagine, which was just, you know, tsunamis, earthquakes, meteors smashing down, huge tidal waves, cities just ripping up out of their foundations and sinking into the sea with skies, just everything, the worst case scenario, and they all survive on an arc, I mean, whatever, you know, but then, then the day after tomorrow also came out around the same time, which is another end time apocalyptic event type movie, just to, just to shake people up a little bit more who are already terrified about the Mayan calendar ending, decided to even just pile more hype onto it. And this is what I'm saying. This is the same thing. I'm seeing the same thing here. Like this is another 
the media is just getting on board with with rolling with it because it seems to have stuck. Oh, people are scared of the end of the world, the Mayan calendar stuff. Let's make a film about it to mess with them. And this this is probably the same thing happening. <laughs> That's come up. It's the same thing happening right now. You know what I mean? Like, oh, people have really latched onto this coming eclipse. Oh, let's let's just let's call the the devil comet is going to be revealed while we're at it. Let's let's sacrifice a few cows over here while we're at it as well. Let's turn CERN on. That'll that'll really mess with them. Like, I mean, like it's they're really they're playing with us here. It's like a huge just psychological trauma based mind control event of some kind. And um, I was speculating about the demon face thing, actually. And I do think that there's something at play here to do with mass traumatizing events. Because a lot of my research into the clowns revealed something very interesting about, about shamans in particular. What it takes to be a shaman. And the Korean Madangs are the Koreans' version of a very ancient shamanistic practice and belief. It's, it's, it's not like Shinto Buddhism or these other common beliefs. It's, it's way older than that. It's like an archaic belief system about communicating with spirits and gods and dead ancestors. But to become a shaman or a Madang, the predominantly women in that culture, some of them are men, but for some reason they're predominantly women in specifically the, 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 the Korean version, but to be a madang, you don't choose to be a madang. What you end up doing is suffering some extreme, brutal, PTSD-causing traumatic event. That you lose loved ones or go through extreme torture or something or extreme illness and almost die in a horrific accident with blood everywhere. Just, just the worst possible thing you can imagine you, and you barely come back from the brink of the, the psychological torture it caused you. And then suddenly, you can communicate with spirits and see the spirit realm. So these madangs end up finding another one who's also a madang and saying, can, can, I've become a madang, the spirits have talked to me and they've told me that I'm now in control of this specific group of demons and gods and I'm, I'm supposed to be their channels, can you train me in how to do it better? And then they get taken under the wing by another madang and they end up being trained up in the, in the, the tradition and then they get hired by rich people to come and do personal little rituals in rich people's homes where they have to channel entities and the rich people pay them to do this so they can talk to the entities through them and get knowledge and wisdom and try and deal with like loved ones not passing through to the other side so they believe but they're just being messed with by demons at the end of the day to leave sacrifices to them out of food all sorts of stuff but the madang literally channels the demon and speaks as in demon talk like spirit talk as they call it and um, the people talk to the demon while they're talking to the person and the demon talks back to them through the madang channel and to prove they actually have been possessed they have to cut themselves with these huge ceremonial blades they stab themselves and they run they run blades along the tongue and they don't bleed or get cut and they heal instantly and that's how they know right the ritual worked this madang is really possessed right now start asking questions go for it right but the point is to be a shaman you have to go through extreme trauma first you have to have been messed with on a serious psychological level and you'll find a lot of people who claim to you know have more of a connection to the spirit realm even in the western world or claim to play by demons or perhaps schizophrenic and these type of things they usually have PTSD or something horrible going on. They have other issues, some extreme abuse as a child. It's well, it's well known in, in Illuminati bloodline families that they're all, all the children are abused hideously. And all the adults that we see in positions of leadership, they were also abused hideously as children. And they'll do the same to their children because they know if you can fracture the child's mind at an early enough age, they'll get that connection to the spirit realm. They'll be able to communicate with demons more readily. And that's why they do it. That's the point. You know, they torture children in these families to make them more eyes more open. Open that third eye, shall we say, or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> so they have that more of that. So they become shamans by any stretch of the imagination. And I, th I think it's funny because when this news came out about this new disorder, just, just discovered in 2014 and finally formalised. We have now have 81 official people who have come forward with this new condition, demon face syndrome, you know, where they can see demon <laughs> faces on people. And it's just happened all of a sudden. And I'm wondering, well, is this happening now all of a sudden because we've been traumatised on a mass scale, especially since, you know, 2020 and what they did to us then? 
and the isolation people were put under and the 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 fear the loss of loved ones the intense fear of just breathing anywhere you know and going leaving their homes it, people who bought into the the narrative of 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 ultimate fear and not to mention what they ended up doing to themselves out of that fear through compliance you know but that, that's just one thing but then this constant cycle of end of the world events and trauma and it just i think people have really messed up now i think like the the brains have been rewired from this constant fear of losing everything at any moment living in in constant survival mode you know with this this the, the doom and gloom cycle of the news cycle is i think it's finally taken its toll on collective humanity in the western world and maybe people are going to start seeing into the spirit realm more because of it and people are going to start noticing demon faces a lot more because of this mass trauma that's been implemented on us for decades and they're just starting to come up with cover stories for it now in preparation for when more and more people start reporting seeing this and i'm wondering is it because of the mass social trauma we've had to go through for so long that we're going to start seeing people who can claim to see demons everywhere because they can because they, they've just had done to them what these shamans have done to them they've had enough trauma to be to finally have their brain cracked and that's what happens and you can look at scans of people who have who have been through child abuse or serious abuse uh, the parts of the brain just switch off and you can get scans of activity and they don't have like frontal lobe activity like, like a normal healthy person so it phys abuse physically changes your brain chemistry you become a different person because of it and you you start to be more connected to, to the spirit realm because of it as well and um maybe this explains why why people are seeing demon faces so there's a little theory i've come up with based on my research what do you think of that i'll throw I that, think that out checks out for sure that checks out hmm. a lot of people had their brains broken in the past four years or so and it might have caused some people to wake up it might have caused uh another large group of people that completely bury their head in the sand even more. And then mm. there's definitely the, the percentage of people who, yeah, probably did encounter some sort of like PTSD or yeah. It, like make it very traumatic for them to be hit with all that out of nowhere without really being aware of it. And whether it was losing their job or losing loved ones, or just always being afraid of all the next stupid thing in the media that's, uh, you know, dreamed up to scare us and turn us against each other. And, yeah, no, that's that's a really interesting theory. I, I think that that's fucking true, though. <laughs> I think there's something to that. Yeah, yeah, because people, are, I don't know, people are trying to say, oh, you know, the veil's thinning or something like that. For, um, and I think it's more personal. I think I think everyone's reality is slightly different based on things like this. You know, to what level have people got the ability to see the spirit realm? That all depends on the individual and how much they've been broken or how many drugs they're taking, basically. And you have to remember as well, you know, especially America, you're such a heavily medicated people. You are so heavily medicated over there. Like, there's giving Prozac out like mints, you know what I mean? And, and wristling and all these type of things. It's like, it's not like, it's not quite like that in England. It's a little bit different um it's 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 a lot harder to get those things not much just a little bit harder but i think you've got more of a money-based system based on selling drugs to people through doctors it's just a highly corrupt system that i wouldn't be surprised that people are just tripping all the time as well and that maybe that's why people are just seeing these things maybe it isn't maybe the trauma isn't always necessary but uh i do think there's something to be said for the the mass the mass fear propaganda that's been put onto us over the past two decades at least especially since you know 9 11 that's when it began that was it. That's when people had the the world shaken. When no one, no one's, nobody's safe. Everyone put, was put into that into the back of the minds from then on. You know, at any moment we could just get attacked from anywhere, and that ruined everything. And I think people, I think we're seeing the side effects. I definitely think we're seeing the the long term psychological side effects. Um. So yeah. Anyway, anyway that, that's what I have to say. But do you want to take? Do you have any questions? Do you want to take that just anywhere else? Any more? Any more? Uh, current events because uh i do get i do fall behind on current events so i like these podcasts where people can tell me what's going on to be honest what else have we got go ahead mike i, I don't know what uh i don't know is i don't know if there's anything like uh like that's breaking or or that's in the last couple of days that i have taken interest in i mean i think the newest thing was the the faces but um tom i don't know do you got i'm sure you got something new well, yeah, I mean, it's all more of <laughs> the same stuff. Uh, the P. Diddy, the, like, uh, Paul, I don't oh, know. Oh, yeah, there is that. With Ryan Garcia, the boxer, do you know about him? 
No, fill me in. I don't follow celebrity culture at all. So you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to tell me this one. Go ahead. So there's a boxer, and uh, he's pretty young too. He's probably like early twenties. So like I think a lot of us are under the understanding that if you are like a top person, whether it's in uh, media or art or music or a- athletes, whatever, no one's susceptible from like being uh, part of this whole, uh, I guess, cabal or whatever, like being blackmailed and pulled into kind of like uh, occult clubs and stuff so you can be mm-hmm. successful. And this boxer, he's been recently like going off before, like all this P Diddy and other like human trafficking stuff was going on. So this was maybe like a month ago that he was like ranting, like he went on like a Twitter live or something. He's like, I was at Bohemian Grove. Like these people, like they were, you know, abusing kids. They were making me watch. Like they did all this, like they're coming after me. Like, and he was like talking about Jesus. He's like, I don't care though. They can come after me. I have, I have Jesus. I, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not one of them and stuff like that. And, uh, Everyone's like, oh, he's a boxer. He's just got brain damage. He's he's on a bender. He's doing a lot of drugs, you know, like even though everything he's talking about has already been verified as being real. And hmm. it just serves to make it look more crazy for anyone that believes him or tries to talk out about it. It's like, oh, he's going schizo. He's He's got CTE. Uh, and then literally like a couple of weeks later, the P. Diddy thing comes out, which, again, it's nothing new to anyone who knows about this type of stuff. It's basically just like they they throw somebody under the bus once in a while and make it look like, Oh, see, uh, we got rid of that problem. Whether it was like Epstein or Mm. now Pete Diddy or whoever, like maybe they owed him money, maybe they double cross somebody. So then they, they throw them under the bus, but realistically all of them have probably participated in some sort of ritual or abuse or whatever, just for the sake of the blackmail. Like if they get you to do something like that and they film it, now you got to play by their rules or they're going to, you know, throw you under the bus. Well, yeah, that that's that's that is the rule. They have to get something on you for you to be in, in in on it. So you have to go to the parties. You have to go to the behind the scenes things. They, it has to be filmed, and you have to take part. And then you know they've got you basically. <laughs> that's it. That's it. They've got you forever. And uh, but the, it's that mutual agreement that we all have something on each other. Nobody's safe. You have to go along with us now. You you're in on this whether you like it or not. But they make it worth your while. They give you a lot of power and influence and money and that type of thing on top of that. Uh, some people don't care because they love doing the horrible things and they're in on it and they're happy to be on it. Some people, like I said, more coerced and blackmailed into it because their pride and their desire for fame outweighed their moral choice making at that point. And they get they get to that point eventually, probably where it's kind of especially musicians. I mean, musicians are just useful idiots at the end of the day they're nothing special like to the controllers and it's kind of you have to remain useful as soon as you're no longer useful then they'll kill you they don't need you you're just a liability then so are you going to be useful or are you going to be a liability as a musician you know and that's why you see all these uh old rock bands that still playing and performing the crappy satanic music well into their 80s. It's like, just die already. Just retire. Have you not made enough money yet? Are you not like multi-billionaires? You really have to keep doing this, playing the same songs forever and ever until you die. Like, can you not just go age gracefully and enjoy your family and your grandchildren instead? You're on another tour around the world for another year. It's like, just stop. Just stop already. And you realize they can't stop. They made the deal. Yep. They have they have to remain useful. Like and as soon as they stop being useful, as soon as they stop spreading the message and singing the songs and maintaining the brainwashing propaganda through the repetition, then the 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 controllers have no use for them anymore and they will just get rid of them because they know too much. They know too much. You're a liability now. I can't you've sinned too much. I can't have you being retired and saying stupid shit on your deathbed. I can't have you doing that. I can't have you writing your memoirs or this type of thing, you know. So it's kind of you keep performing the songs, you keep doing what we're telling you to do until you die of a heart attack on the toilet or something. Either way, you're not, you have to remain useful. As soon as you become a liability, then you get, like I said, thrown under the bus or or killed or murdered. So I, it's just more, this is more of the same. And what I've just said there, you can apply that to pretty much every major celebrity death. You know that's what's happened. You know that's what's 100%. happened to them, you know, and it's 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 really sad, isn't it? I just did a, I just did a rant actually on on uh, magic and how magic actually works and how the music industry works as well. So um, I can maybe rehash a bit of that rant for you guys here now in a way, but it's it's one of these things I kind of I don't talk enough about on the channel. I would say that I need to start talking about this more. It used to be a huge focus for what I used to talk about, but I got a little bit distracted with the clowns, you know, and the other things. So maybe I'm, I'm going to start 
bringing it back to talking about just how what the occult really is because there's this huge massive hollywood misconception of what magic is in a lot of people's minds i think some people really do believe that magic is is sparkles flying out of the end of wands i think that's what they actually think magic is opening portals by spinning your arms something like this or something you know what i mean they actually think that's what it is and it's it's way scarier than that <laughs> in, a, in a in a subtle way it, it's not it's not sunshine lollipops and focusing your chi and making uh, things blast out of your hands you know it's not that's not magic you know and that's why people say oh magic isn't real because they can't see examples of the hollywood examples in front of them of course magic's not real no one's doing these things or levitating or doing all that like that magic isn't real you know because there's like i said Hollywood has tricked people into not really knowing what magic is. Magic is words. Magic is art. That's it. That's the secret. People need to realize this quickly. And it's, it's actually quite obvious once you realize the techniques used against us. Magic is the ability to make people do things without ever touching or speaking to them directly. That's witchcraft, right? Casting a spell and doing the right incantations. An incantation is a rhyme is a rhythm bippity boppity boo abracadabra all right these are that's music that's the hint that's the hollywood joke towards the truth of what it is making a rhythm and a rhyme and slapping words together in rhythmic order is how you get into people's brains it's how you influence them that's the, the hinting at it in the disney cartoons to what magic actually is it's language it's words I can say things and influence people to do stuff. That's magic. That's what the occult practice of magic actually is. And it doesn't sound as fantastical when I say it out loud, but its results are extremely powerful when utilized correctly. So, you know, to spell a word is to cast a spell. That's how it works. 100%. You know, and broadcast media is a broad casting of a spell it's the they've cast it on a broad spectrum you know they are casting out a a broad spell over everybody you know it's a broad net that they're encapsulating everybody into the spell of and you get emergency broadcasts it's an emergency magic spell to keep people under the illusion they want to create it's illusion it's smoke and mirrors it's a narrative yes. They've written that's a. Why, go ahead oh, sorry that, that i'm sorry that's why a tv show is called a program because they're programming you absolutely yeah that's art art is magic in any form or any media and it has the power to be good and bad sure you could argue that you know whatever god's a creator he's a he's an artist you know and we're made in his image we have the same capacity and ability to create ourselves and people have abused the knowledge of these sacred sciences for their own purposes that's what's happened okay and the people who have all the knowledge or let's say own all the industries which have the ultimate resources to utilize the magic which is the media industry let's say you know or the education industry where people read their books uh, learn their songs uh, learn their talents their crafts their skills the education systems you know they own all the sciences you know and as a way that's they own the magic the source to all magic and uh, art is is the tool that's how it's done you know, like magic wands for example you know, the hollywood it's basically based on the, the Hollywood yep. wands that people use. But at the same time, a wand is just a direction stick. It's a thing you, you point at things because that's where you want to take people's direction. That's where you want their attention to go. That's what a wand's for. So a guy who's at a whiteboard using a stick to point to things, he's using a wand to direct your attention. Okay? And that's all it is. That's, that's, the, that's the joke, you know. The, the wand doesn't have any power in of itself because it's a stick. It's where they're pointing it to that... It gives them authority to make your eyes move over there. And Hollywood is the metaphorical stick pointing in the direction of where they want to send your attention. They create the attention getters, the movies, the films, the, the programs, the scripts. They're directing your eye, eyesight and thoughts and feelings and emotions towards something. They are the wand. They are the Hollywood. You know, that's basically all it is. And it's, it's, it's not as fantastical it's actually more nefarious and subtle than we could ever imagine. So I'm not saying, for example, every bit of artwork is evil. Not at all. I'm an artist and a musician myself, okay? But you have to test the spirits, and that literally means you have to listen to the words of a song, for example, or 
interpret the meaning that the artist told you of what a painting or image or piece of artwork or movie is actually about, then you've got to watch the thing and say, does that actually match up to what they're talking about? Or is there subtle hidden stuff in this? Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. There's some good, genuine, talented musicians out there with fantastic music that's that's actually uplifting for humanity and actually really good and fascinating and talented and, and, and brilliant in its message and positive. But this, that's not what's in the charts more often than not. That's not the one that gets played on the radio over and over again on loop. Okay, what it usually is is controlled, orchestrated media on there. And you look at the charts, any chart anywhere in the world, you get US charts, UK charts, the top 40s, whatever it is. And you have to wonder, where did this musician just come from? I've never heard of them before. And suddenly this is the pinnacle of humanity's creation process that they get to be played on the radio at the number one spot for a month like non-stop this is the best humanity has to offer you know beyonce singing in a texan accent this is it this is the pinnacle of human creation you've got to be joking right this is right some some cheap simulacrum of true country music like who decides who gets to decide what is and isn't good music and it's all it's controlled and orchestrated because these are designed spells these are designed pieces of magic that they want to influence people with. And there's, we have to always question the intent behind something. And you have, just listen to the lyrics. Because a lot of people who get caught up in the spell of music, they don't actually listen to the words being sung to them. They're too busy listening to the nice melody and getting caught up with how pretty it sounds. But listen to the words. It might sound really pretty, but they're basically telling you to do the worst possible things for yourself and live a terrible life just sounding nice while they say it and that's how they get the magic in and people need to learn this like this this is the secret this is this is the this is what the occult wisdoms really are that's that's practical human magic used to influence people you know you and it, that's what a spell is is getting in someone's mind and creating influence there is the other side of magic which is demonic in nature and it's quite literally making contracts with demons for strength knowledge power wisdoms things like this and their contractual deals made through it, through ritual and that's a, a lot of what i get into in my work about wearing costumes to channel things and you know i feed the demon i let it use my senses to experience stuff and in return i get the strength of 10 men or something or i get the ability not to get cut by a blade or stabbed or whatever it is there's usually some transaction involved that's a different kind of magic you know that that's more of the that's the spiritual side of magic but all magic on that side is just contracts with demons that's where it comes from there's, there's nothing else to it. It's not because that person who's levitating over there knows how to levitate. There's literally just an invisible giant picking him up that you can't see. You get what I mean? It's just, there's no power in of his, on of his own volition or talent or skill. And uh, that's another that's another type of magic. And that's the more fantastical type. Uh, people who can predict the future. People who can, who can know all these things about you without ever knowing anything about you. Sure, you could say it's cold reading and just explain it away with, you know, they just have clever word choices and have influenced you to give give away stuff without you realizing it. Or there's a demon whispering in their rear stuff about you that that demon knows because it's followed you for your entire life. And that's the deal. You get to look really smart and powerful and intelligent and like you have magical powers. The demon gets to use you and you make sacrifice to it on a regular basis so it can enjoy things through you. That's that's the, the two types of magic that exist. That's what it truly is. <laughs> How did I make that happen? <laughs> magic. <laughs> magic. Magic. I, magic. I agree. In pretty much all forms of entertainment. And like, it's crazy when you look to, I don't think there's a single sport around that wasn't invented by like Freemasons or at least like the rule set. And like, you know, I'm sure the sports go way back before too, but a lot of them are even, you know, homages to the gods or like, if you lose or you win, like sometimes it was the winners who would be sacrificed, like because they it was like a privilege to be sacrificed to the gods if you won in some like Aztec game or something, or mm. like baseball, football, uh, basketball, everything like all these games, like when you look at it, are made by Freemasons and like designed to kind of be a ritual itself for everybody to watch. Like you got the people wearing all their logos and like the word fan, like fanatics, like they're just mm. that's their religion. It's like they'll say, like, oh, my game day ritual and stuff like that. And it, it really is like more important than anything to them. Some people's like sports teams or uh, just being a fan is like their whole identity. And they would have no idea that they're kind of like giving their energy over to a, 
a magic ritual and like mm-hmm. i'm a wrestler mm-hmm. and that's mainly what i do i have a video on my uh youtube channel about how wrestling is a spiritual ritual like it's done in a circle like pretty much you're always cast in a circle and all these occult things or whatever and it goes back to like honoring the gods or you had jacob wrestling with god in the bible and just pretty much all these sports have a spiritual undertone and it's like widely viewed by millions of people regularly just being influenced without even knowing i find sports for example is a lot like uh, porn is that's that the magic at play there is wasted potential they're trying to get people to waste their energies on useless things and that's what those rituals are for the energy draining rituals they're not to empower anything or anybody really um it's to make you waste your time and that's yeah. basically that's 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 the magic at play there that's the true magic that's the influence they're playing at otherwise fit powerful men who you know perhaps family working men who are down to earth salt of the earth type men are instead fascinated over a ball being moved around a football pitch and being kicked into a net and right. it, rather than you know building strong communities and being strong examples for children all these the, the things that people need to do to keep a cohesive society it's about wasting that that energy and that power and that potential on something trivial and useless and that's entertainment at the end that's all entertainment ever is which is why again i said at the beginning of this i don't really follow any of it so i don't know what's going on so i need people to tell me about these new revelations of people being thrown under the bus or something like that because um i switched off a long time ago and i've never actually liked sports i, I, I my, my my dad is, was very disappointed in me that i didn't care about football as i grew up i'm just not interested in kicking a ball around I just, I just never saw the point. Like, I just, I, it was never in my mind to understand how anybody was interested in any of this. I've just never been the, the closest thing I got to enjoying any kind of, I uh, say, sport extremely loosely here because it's a game, not a sport. Is snooker, <laughs> like, and pool, you know, uh, things like that. And that's the only one I ever really enjoyed playing. But I never followed it. I didn't watch the tournaments or anything like that, you know, and. Uh, that's as close as I got to any kind of sport. I was just not interested. And uh, as I grew, grew up, I've always had that mindset of watching these people do these things. And I never, I could never understand it until I started learning about all the occult stuff. And it, it did all kind of click into place. And I can, I can, I've seen firsthand the waste that goes into the energy that goes into oh, yeah. obsessing over these idols that they've created, which is their team. Their, 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 their team and that team over there is the bad team and mine's the good team and it's just it's just an odd tribal way of being and and I've, I've heard all the the excuses of how it's actually a good thing like well you know it gives people a, a release from the pressures of reality who are you to say what is and isn't good and what people should and shouldn't enjoy with their time and all the, and I, I still i just can't get on board with it it's a huge waste of time on like a mass scale and not to mention the money involved with all of this stuff as well like these people get paid millions millions upon it's a money hole it's a huge money hole and it is again in a way that is if you want to see it as ritual it's well while we're getting more and more into national debt people are homeless and starving and all the bad things yet we were happy for all this wealth to be invested into trivial nonsense that in its own right is a part of the ritual something about that it just adds to the nefarious nature of the whole thing from my opinion um but you know you've got me you've got me off on another rant there and something else like <laughs> I don't know. people take it very personally when you attack their sports team oh they do it's a personal yeah. attack it's not just they can't detach themselves from 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 entertainment you know and um it's like a religion in a way it really is it really is and uh We'll be having to wrap this up in a minute here. I know Mike's got some roofers on his house that he has to <laughs> tend to, but something yeah. you said, uh, like kind of relating sports to porn, I I feel like that is true because you're like living through someone else. Yeah, like you said, like maybe some like strong or fit men of you know, like honor or integrity or whatever. They're they're now putting all that into like, oh yeah, my team. Like look at this guy. Like they're they're mm-hmm. trying to live through some other like athletic person or porn you're watching someone else have sex and trying to like live through that or it's mm-hmm. even like now one of the most popular like forms of content for kids is like watching someone else play a video game watching another kid play with yeah. toys like, <laughs> it's really weird it's like conditioning us to just 
be happy with an artificial version of something. Mm -hmm. Especially with the virtual reality headsets coming oh, on as dude. well. That's changing the game, especially for the porn industry, I imagine. That's seriously changing the game. No one's going to leave the house oh, anymore, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. But again, wasted we'll potential, isn't it? Like, yep. but I played a lot of video games growing up too. You know, I, I was in it. I was there with the technology as it developed. So I was, I was obsessed with gaming. I was a first person shooter guy. You know what I mean? I was really, I was into that, you know, and, and if I look back on the, the hours I have spent playing those things and I think it's a waste when in hindsight, it's an absolute waste of time. And I enjoyed every minute of it while it was happening. Don't get me wrong, but it like, I, I still regret wasting that time. It, regardless of whether i enjoyed it or not like it's and my xbox is actually um sat there under the tv <laughs> and it hasn't moved from that spot in three years it's not even plugged in anymore and there's cheerios shoved in the disc rack from my uh, two-year-old just trying to grab it and putting <laughs> stuff in there because i it's i don't have time as a father first of all and i'm and i don't want to like because i i know what i'm like as soon as i tr turn it on i'm on it then for months it's like an addiction it's that type of thing so i'm gonna get rid of the thing i'm probably not gonna buy another console for the rest of, for the rest of my life now um i spent so many hours on that thing like and and part of me has this feeling inside it's like well you need to keep playing the game so you can see what the latest propaganda is but i could just watch a video for that now because everyone's streaming it everywhere. They'll yeah, come just watch someone else do it. <laughs> yeah, I can watch someone else do it. <laughs> or I can just quickly get the synopsis off Wikipedia or something. It doesn't really matter anymore. But uh, uh, what the gist I got from the end of it all is all just anti-God Gnostic nonsense. Every little bit of it is all about transhumanists, um, superpowers, um, you know, killing people and Gnostic alternatives to reality and spiritualism, things like Dark Souls and stuff like that, or twists and parodies on Christian theology, making God out to be the bad guy and humanity has to kill him. That's generally what every single video game has ever been about, ever. One of those topics. <laughs> like, and, and it's just another controlled industry as far as I'm concerned. But again, it's it's all just a part of waste, wasting your potential. I mean, on porn, not only the vi living vicariously through other people thing, you know, like, and, but it's also the masturbation aspect of it makes you, well, you're not actually doing the thing in real life anymore. And you're, you're wasting your, your life pursuing a real wife and family and all that type of thing and actually procreating because you're artificially satisfying your neuronic your neurons and your brain and tricking it into thinking you've already done all those things. And again, it just makes you weaker. It makes you sadder, more lonely, more isolated. Just the same thing drugs do to you eventually. You believe you're getting something wonderful from it, and but it's just making you lonelier, more isolated, more cut off from reality. Weird. It's making you weird so people don't want to be around you. Sure. You know, it, all these things do the same thing and i, I think the magic is in the industry of creating obsession and it's in the magic is the industry of wasting your time and uh, so turn it off switch off get him touch touch grass as people say <laughs> yeah get out get out there for real yeah. though i suppose that's that's all i have to say on that topic <laughs> any uh closing thoughts paul or mike no, I'm good, man. Thanks for doing this. This is uh, it's always fun, and yeah, your voice is the first thing that anybody hears from our podcast. It's uh, our intro song. <laughs> your, your, boom, your voice. So yeah, appreciate it, brother. Go. Cool. Well, I've I've not listened to that. I have to go listen to that. Fair enough. Um, yeah, sounds fun. Well, is it? Am I ranting about the millennial kingdom? Is it one of those rants? Uh, Nephilim. <laughs> Nephilim. We're doing that. Okay. I don't know. I do a lot of rants. So I get, right. I get, I get stuck sometimes. And, uh, yeah, fair enough. No, no, guys, it's been great talking to you. Thanks for having me back on. Um, yeah. we'll Thank do it. You, we'll do it again sometime. You know, I'm Absolutely. always, I'm always, maybe when the book gets released, I'll, I'll read a chapter or something. That'd be great. And we'll go from there. Well, take care, brother. You too, guys. Thanks for having me. Bye now. Take, take it easy, man.